This tape describes the musculoskeletal system of the trunk. We'll look at the trunk in four sections. In this first section, we'll look at the spine and the spinal cord. In the following sections, we'll look at the thorax, the abdomen, and the pelvis. The spine is known in anatomy as the vertebral column or spinal column. In looking at it, we'll look first at the bones, then at the structures that hold the bones together, then at the main muscles which move it. After that, we'll add the spinal cord and the spinal nerves to the picture. Here's the vertebral column. It consists of 24 separate vertebrae, the sacrum, and the coccyx. There are seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae. The sacrum consists of five vertebral segments fused together. The coccyx, or vestigial tail, consists of three or four tiny segments. The highest cervical vertebra articulates with the skull. The thoracic vertebrae articulate with the ribs. And the sacrum articulates with the two innominate bones to form the pelvis. When seen from in front, the spine appears straight. But when we look at it from the side, we see that it's markedly curved. The lower cervical vertebrae form a forward curve. The thoracic vertebrae form a backward curve, the lumbar vertebrae curve forward again, and the sacrum curves sharply backward. These pieces of material represent the intervertebral discs, which we'll be looking at shortly. The vertebrae of each region are numbered from above down. Instead of using the words cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, we often just use the letters C, T, L, and S. For example, we'd call the fourth lumbar vertebra the L4 vertebra. There are marked differences between vertebrae of different regions, but they all have some basic features in common. We'll look at a typical thoracic vertebra to see what these features are. In front, this cylindrical mass of bone, the body of the vertebra, supports the weight of everything that's above it. Behind, there's a set of bony plates and projections which serve three functions, to protect the spinal cord, to give attachment to muscles and ligaments, and to articulate with the adjoining vertebrae. This arch of bone, the neural arch, encloses the spinal cord. The space that's surrounded by the arch and the back of the body is called the vertebral foramen. The series of vertebral foramina create the tubular space that contains the spinal cord. The space is called the vertebral canal. This part of the neural arch is called the lamina. This part is the pedicle. There's a small notch in the upper edge of the pedicle and a larger notch in the lower edge. Together, the notches above and below form this opening on each side, the intervertebral foramen. A spinal nerve emerges through each intervertebral foramen. Arising from the neural arch are three large bony projections called processes. A spinous process in the midline, a transverse process on each side. Also arising from the neural arch are four articular processes two above and two below. The lower ones face forward, the upper ones face backward. The articular processes of adjoining vertebrae interlock, forming a pair of synovial joints which permit movement between adjoining vertebrae. Now that we've looked at one vertebra, Let's look at the specialized and different features of vertebrae from the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar parts of the spine. Here's a typical cervical vertebra, the fourth one. 
The body is small. The upper surface of the body is curved, somewhat in the shape of a saddle. The lower surface has the same curvature in reverse. The vertebral foramen is large and triangular. The neural arch is formed mainly by the two straight laminae. The pedicles are very short. The spinous process is short and ends in a double point. The upper articular facets face upward and inward. The lower ones face downward and forward. The mass of bone between the articular facets is called the articular pillar. The transverse processes arise from the side of the body and also from here on the articular pillar. The transverse process of a cervical vertebra has a hole in it, the transverse foramen, through which the vertebral artery passes. The transverse process is shaped like a gutter pointing downwards. It ends in two tubercles, an anterior and a posterior, where the scalene muscles attach. Of the seven cervical vertebrae, the first two, which are called the atlas and the axis, differ from the others in several ways. We'll see them in detail in volume four of this atlas. The seventh cervical vertebra also differs from the others in that it has a long spinous process, ending in a single point which forms this small prominence on the back of the neck. The cervical vertebrae form the most mobile part of the spine, partly because of the curved shape of their bodies, which makes flexion and extension easy, and partly because of the shallow slope of their articular processes, which makes lateral flexion easy. The movements that can occur in the cervical spine are forward flexion, extension, and lateral flexion to one side or the other. Rotation also occurs in the neck. Almost all of it happens at the specialized joints between the atlas and the axis vertebrae, which we'll look at in the tape on the head and neck, volume four of this atlas. In that tape, we'll also look at the way the atlas vertebra articulates with the bone that forms the underside of the skull, the occipital bone. The joints between the atlas and the occipital bone are called the atlanto-occipital joints. Next, we'll look at the special features of the thoracic vertebrae. The bodies of the thoracic vertebrae become progressively more massive from above down, as they do from the top to the bottom of the vertebral column. Each of the thoracic vertebrae articulates with a pair of ribs. On each side, the vertebra articulates with the rib at two points. Here, at the end of the transverse process, and here, where the pedicle meets the body. We'll be looking at the ribs in the second section of this tape. The transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae point sideways. The spinous processes point downwards, each one overlapping the one below. The articular processes are almost vertical. The upper ones face almost straight backwards. The lower ones face forwards. There's only a little movement between thoracic vertebrae, partly because of the presence of the ribs and partly because of the way the spinous processes are arranged. The movements that are possible are small amounts of forward flexion, lateral flexion, and, perhaps surprisingly, rotation. Now, we'll take a look at a lumbar vertebra. The body is massive. The transverse processes are small. 
the spinous process is broad and points almost straight backwards. The upper articular processes of lumbar vertebrae face inward. The lower ones face outward. Because of this arrangement, there's almost no rotation between lumbar vertebrae. The movements that can occur in the lumbar spine are flexion, extension, and lateral flexion to either side. Lastly, we'll look at the sacrum. Besides being the lowest part of the spine, the sacrum is also an important part of the pelvis. Here's the sacrum together with the coccyx. The sacrum is formed by five vertebrae fused together. From top to bottom, it has a marked backward curve. When we're standing upright, the sacrum is oriented just as we see it here. The upper part of this backward-facing dorsal surface is angled at about 45 degrees to the vertical. The upper part of this forward-facing pelvic surface is more nearly horizontal than vertical. On the dorsal surface, there are two articular processes for the fifth lumbar vertebra. The lowest intervertebral disc is quite wedge-shaped. Its shape accounts in part for the very marked curvature of the spine between the fourth lumbar vertebra and the sacrum. The most anterior point on the sacrum is called the sacral promontory. The vertebral canal continues down the back of the sacrum. From within the vertebral canal, the anterior rami of the spinal nerves, S1 to S4, emerge from these pelvic sacral foramina. The posterior rami emerge from these dorsal sacral foramina. The vertebral canal ends at this opening, the sacral hiatus, that's shaped like an upside-down V. This curved auricular surface articulates on each side with the upper part of the innominate bone, or hip bone, to form the pelvis. The joints between the sacrum and the hip bones are the sacroiliac joints. These joints permit almost no movement. The broad ridge on each hip bone adjoining the sacrum is the iliac crest. It's an important muscle attachment, as we'll see shortly. We'll be looking at the hip bone in more detail in the last section of this tape. For now, we'll return to the spine. Now that we've looked at the dry bones of the vertebral column, let's look at the structures that hold the bones together and that enable them to move. We'll look first at the intervertebral discs, then at the ligaments of the vertebral column, then at the posterior joints. These structures are arranged in a similar way from the top of the spine to the bottom. We'll be looking at all of them in the lumbar region. Here's an intervertebral disc. The disc is a massive pad of fibrocartilage that's firmly attached to the vertebral body above and below, all the way around the circumference. If we cut through a disc and look at it from above, we see that it's made of concentric layers of material. The disc consists of an outer ring of tough fibrocartilage called the annulus fibrosus and a soft center of almost liquid material called the nucleus pulposus. The disc is solid enough to transmit the weight of the body and it's flexible enough to permit movement between the vertebrae. The side of the intervertebral disc forms the anterior margin of the intervertebral foramen, through which the spinal nerve emerges. The vertebrae are also held together by ligaments. Some of these go from vertebra to vertebra, some run the length of the spine. Starting at the back, we'll look at the ligaments which hold the spinous processes together, the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments.
Then we'll look at the ligament that holds the laminae together, the ligamentum flavum. Then we'll look at the two ligaments which help to hold the bodies together, the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. First, the interspinous ligaments. Here they are. They run from the lower edge of one spinous process to the upper edge of the next one. Now we'll add the supraspinous ligament to the picture. The supraspinous ligament merges with the interspinous ligaments. It runs the whole length of the vertebral column, connecting the tips of the spinous processes. The supraspinous ligament serves as a midline attachment for some important muscles, as we'll see later. These ligaments help to limit flexion of the spine. The structure, or structures, that chiefly limit flexion of the vertebral column is the series of short ligaments that hold the laminae together, which are known collectively as the ligamentum flavum. The ligamentum flavum lies on the front of the laminae. To see it, we'll cut through the pedicles of all the vertebrae along this line and look at the laminae from the inside. Here's the ligamentum flavum. It goes from one lamina to the next, all the way down the spine. Here, where it's been cut through, we can see how thick it is. The ligamentum flavum is made of yellowish fibroelastic tissue, hence its name, which means yellow ligament. Next, we'll look at the two ligaments which hold the vertebral bodies together, the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. The anterior is the stronger of the two. Here it is. The anterior longitudinal ligament covers the front and sides of the vertebral bodies. It runs the whole length of the vertebral column. We'll cut through it along this line to see it better. The anterior longitudinal ligament is thick and strong. It's attached to the upper and lower edges of each vertebral body. It limits extension of the spine. In extension, the tightness of the anterior longitudinal ligament helps to prevent backward and forward movement of the vertebral bodies relative to each other. The posterior longitudinal ligament runs along the back of the vertebral bodies. To see it, we'll divide the pedicles along this line again and look at the bodies by themselves. Here's the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's narrow where it overlies each body, and it widens out to cover the back of each disc. The posterior longitudinal ligament helps in a small way to limit flexion of the vertebral column. Each vertebra is attached to its neighbors not only by the intervertebral discs and the ligaments that we've seen, but also by the joints between the articular processes, the posterior joints. Each posterior joint is surrounded by a capsular ligament, which is loose enough to permit the small amount of movement that occurs between any two vertebrae. The capsular ligament has no great strength, but the articular processes themselves are strong. Because the upper ones face forward and the lower ones backward, the articular processes prevent the vertebra above from slipping forward relative to the vertebra below. Now that we've looked at the vertebrae and at the structures that hold them together, we're almost ready to move on to look at the principal muscles of the vertebral column. Before we do that, let's briefly review what we've seen so far. If you'd like to use the following review to test yourself, turn off the sound and name the structures as they're shown. Here's a cervical vertebra, a thoracic vertebra, and a lumbar vertebra. Here are the body, the vertebral canal, the pedicle, the lamina, the transverse processes, the spinous process, the articular processes, and the intervertebral foramen. In the cervical vertebra, here's the anterior tubercle, 
and the posterior tubercle of the transverse process. And here's the transverse foramen. Here's the sacrum, the coccyx, the pelvic sacral foramina, the dorsal sacral foramina, and the sacral hiatus. Here's an intervertebral disc, the annulus fibrosus, and the nucleus pulposus. Here are the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments, the ligamentum flavum, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and the anterior longitudinal ligament. Now we'll look at the muscles. Most movements of the vertebral column are produced by an extensive set of muscles that run all the way along the back of the spine. They're known collectively as the paravertebral muscles. The highest of them are attached to the base of the skull. The lowest ones arise from the sacrum and iliac crest. Some in between are attached to the backs of the ribs and many are attached to the transverse and spinous processes of the vertebrae. We'll build up our picture of these muscles from the inside to the outside. This is a dissection of the mid-thoracic region. On the left side, all the paravertebral muscles are in place, partly hidden beneath a covering layer of fascia. On the right side, all the paravertebral muscles have been removed. We're not concerned at present with these outlying muscles, the levators and the intercostals. Now, we'll add the paravertebral muscles to the picture, starting with the ones that lie deepest, the short and long rotator muscles. Each short rotator goes from a transverse process to the base of the spinous process of the vertebra above. Each long rotator goes to the same point on the next vertebra but one. The rotators are overlaid by this series of more obliquely running strips of muscle, which together form one long muscle, the multifidus muscle. Each segment of the multifidus arises from a transverse process and inserts on the sides of the spinous processes two to four vertebrae above. The rotators and the multifidus extend the whole length of the spine. Their action is to produce rotation of the upper part of the spine towards the opposite side. These deep rotating muscles are overlaid by much larger muscles. To get a picture of these remaining paravertebral muscles, we'll divide them into a lower group, the long muscles of the lumbar and thoracic regions, and an upper group, the long muscles of the back of the neck. The two groups overlap. We'll look at the lower group first. They're known collectively as the erector spiny muscles. They form a large mass of muscle, extending all the way from the sacrum to the upper part of the thorax. At their origins, they're joined together. Passing upward, they separate out into three somewhat distinct muscles, the spinalis, the longissimus thoracis, and the iliocostalis lumborum. The erector spiny muscles arise from this massive common tendon of origin, which is attached to the spinous processes of the lumbar vertebrae, to the back of the sacrum, and to the iliac crest. Spinalis inserts onto the spinous processes of the upper thoracic vertebrae. Longissimus thoracis inserts on the lower nine ribs and the adjoining transverse processes. Iliocostalis lamborum inserts further out on the lower six ribs. The erector spiny muscles are important in keeping the body upright. The action that they have depends on whether they contract on both sides at once or on one side only. When they contract on one side only, they produce lateral flexion of the spine to one side or the other. When they contract on both sides at once, their action produces extension of the lumbar and thoracic spine, straightening our back as we stand up from a stooping position and keeping it straight 
as we lean forward. The action of the erector spiny group is counteracted by muscles of the abdominal wall, which we'll see later in this tape. Above the erector spiny muscles and overlapping with them are the long muscles of the back of the neck, which we'll look at just briefly at this point. They're the obliquely running splenius and longissimus muscles, and beneath them the vertically running semispinalis. Here's its upper end. We'll look at the muscles of the neck in a lot more detail in Volume 4 of this atlas. Now we'll move on to look at the vitally important contents of the vertebral canal, the spinal cord, the spinal nerves, and the protective layers of tissue that surround them. We'll look first at a cross-sectional view of the vertebral canal. This is a cut through the sixth thoracic vertebra. Here's the spinal cord. It only partway fills the vertebral canal. On each side, there are two lines of nerve filaments, one arising from the ventral aspect and one from the dorsal aspect of the cord. These filaments form the spinal nerves, as we'll see in a minute. The spinal cord lies within this strong protective layer, the dura. The dura is lined on the inside by a loosely attached membrane, the arachnoid. The cord is covered on the outside by a firmly attached membrane, the pia. The space between the arachnoid and the pia is called the subarachnoid space. In life, it's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The space between the dura and the wall of the vertebral canal is called the epidural space. It's filled with fat, loose connective tissue, and blood vessels. To see the contents of the vertebral canal from end to end, we'll take a look from behind at a dissection in which all the laminae have been divided along these lines and removed. Here's the sacrum. Here's the base of the skull. The tissues that occupy the epidural space have been removed to give us a clear look at the dura. This is the dura. The sleeve of dura is called the dural sac. It's open at the top end and closed at the bottom. Here, at the base of the skull, the dural sac passes through the foramen magnum, becoming continuous with the layer of dura that surrounds the brain. At the bottom end, within the vertebral canal of the sacrum, the dural sac tapers down to a point at the level of the second sacral segment. To look at the spinal cord, we'll divide the dura in the midline and lay it aside. Here's the spinal cord. In the early embryo, the spinal cord extends the whole length of the vertebral column. But as development progresses, the vertebral column grows much more rapidly than the cord. The cord ends up filling only the upper two-thirds of the vertebral canal. The lower end of the cord, in the adult, is at the level of the first lumbar vertebra. Let's see some more details. These are nerve roots. We'll look at them in a minute. The cord is attached to the dura by a series of fine triangular ligaments, the denticulate ligaments. To see how the spinal nerves arise, we'll go up to the cervical region. The denticulate ligaments have been divided. Each spinal nerve arises from a small bundle of dorsal filaments, which unite to form the dorsal sensory root of the nerve, and a similar bundle of ventral filaments, which unite to form the ventral motor root. In the cervical region, the nerve roots follow a slightly oblique downward course. In the thoracic region, their course becomes more oblique. 
Here, right at the lower end of the spinal cord, this continuous line of nerve filaments gives rise to a large number of nerve roots, which run vertically downwards, almost hiding the very end of the cord, which is here. Below this point, the dural sac is occupied not by the cord, but by this leash of vertically running lumbar and sacral nerve roots, the corda equina. The nerve roots leave the vertebral canal, two at a time, all the way down to the lower end of the sacrum. Let's follow the course of one spinal nerve as it passes from inside the subarachnoid space to its emergence from the intervertebral foramen. To see this, we'll look at the cervical spine in a dissection in which all the surrounding muscles have been removed and in which the laminae have also been removed along these lines as in the previous dissection. Here are the roots of the nerve leaving the dural sac. Here's the nerve emerging from the intervertebral foramen. To see the whole course of the nerve, we need to remove this part of the vertebra. Here's the dorsal root of the nerve. Here's the ventral root. The sleeve of dura that surrounds the converging nerve roots merges with the outer layer of the spinal nerve. This thickening at the very beginning of the spinal nerve is the dorsal root ganglion. The spinal nerve passes forward and laterally to emerge from the intervertebral foramen. To see that more clearly, we'll go back to the preceding stage of the dissection. As the spinal nerve emerges, it divides into this small posterior primary ramus and this much larger anterior primary ramus. The posterior primary rami of the spinal nerves pass backward to supply the muscles and skin on the back of the body. The anterior rami pass forward and laterally to supply all the rest of the body. This anterior ramus is an unusually large one. It's one of a set of five large rami between C5 and T1 which form the brachial plexus. The major nerves to the upper extremity emerge from the brachial plexus. The anterior rami from L1 to S3 are also large. They form the lumbar and sacral plexuses, which give rise to the nerves for the lower extremity. These plexuses are shown in volumes 1 and 2 of this atlas. There's a man-made puzzle that we need to clear up regarding the numbering of the spinal nerves. In the cervical region, each spinal nerve takes its number from the vertebra below it. But from T1 on down, each nerve takes its number from the vertebra above it. The result is that there's one nerve, the one that emerges between C7 and T1, for which there's no corresponding vertebra. It's called C8. Now we're almost ready to move on to section two of this tape. Before we do that, let's briefly review what we've seen of the muscles of the back and the contents of the vertebral canal. Here are the short rotators, the long rotators, and the multifidus. Here's the erector spinae, spinalis, longissimus thoracis, and iliocostalis lumborum. Now, the features of the vertebral canal. Here's the spinal cord, the dura, the arachnoid, the pia, the subarachnoid space, the epidural space. Here are the dorsal filaments, the dorsal root, the ventral filaments, and the ventral root. Here's the dorsal root ganglion. Here's the spinal nerve, the anterior primary ramus, and the posterior primary ramus. Lastly, here's the corda equina. That brings us to the end of the first section of this tape. In the next section, we'll look at the thorax.